<laughs> Are you ready? Ready? But do, in front of the mic. All right. Uh, this is a hard thing for me to do in front of the mic. Uh, the other thing is, is, I know that you don't want to hear me, that you want to hear Benedetta, but I want to say a few words because I, I am so happy to welcome a very, very dear friend. Uh, after five years of stalking Benedetta, uh, I finally got her here, you know, and it's spectacular for me to have her here. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the AA, back to the AA, uh, and particularly on account of the exhibition, uh, on account of the exhibition of Tony Kumela's just across in the gallery. Um, listen, I have just a couple quick things. Uh, for me, it's going to be 60 minutes of pure pleasure. Um, I have loved Enrique and Benedetta's work uh, ever since they started collaborating together, and I think it's a testament to Benedetta's talent, just how extraordinarily she has taken the studio on and produced ever more fascinating projects. Um, as a final note, the only thing I would say is that Benedetta last year set up the Enrique Morales Foundation. I think that she's going to say something about it at the end, but I want you all to visit this. Uh, it's in their offices, which if you haven't ever been before in Barcelona, are truly spectacular. Um, on that note, Benedetta, welcome, and I pass over to you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Chris. It's really fantastic to be here with you. And also we will think at uh, the other Chris, because uh, he's in a in a kind of sad moment, so we are together with him. And I really have to, to remember that uh, Chris and Chris were always fantastic figures in, uh, in my life in these last years, coming to Barcelona, introducing me with this experimental world they are doing with uh, their students in their studio and, and really being fascinating. L let's say they say they, they love our work, but they, we love their work. It's uh, really absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and today it was fantastic to be in their studio again and to see what everybody can do inspired by them. So it, we, we have this, no? We have to inspire each other always and, uh, and maybe sometimes to copy. <laughs> but uh, today I'm trying uh, to make this video work, which is <laughs> not uh, my, my... Thing in uh, in uh, Harvard this year in the studio we did, and I realized that everything is so mechanized. But oh, this is very very artisanal. We do everything we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe this video, which which I don't know what's what's happening in the video, but I, it's just something. We have a studio which is uh, dealing with, uh, with hands and dealing with, uh, with doing things and with experimenting things and with trying. And I'm here because of, uh, of someone which we have been collaborating with, in, uh, especially in this project in Barcelona, who is Tony Cumella. In a way, uh, this has to do with hands, no? He's, uh, he's a fantastic artisan. And uh, some years ago, he came to our office and he started to talk to us about uh, what his father was doing. He was an artist during, doing ceramic and that he was continuing with this uh, um, way, artisan way of doing, but he was very special <coughs> and he was coming back with uh, uh, pieces from, from the modernistic times and from Gaudi. And, and really he was so, so incredibly inspiring. So uh, this inspiring man was inspiring to everybody and also now he is uh, doing a fantastic exhibition showing how he could collaborate with architects in the last years, uh, inspiring the architects to do some of their best pieces. And in Santa Caterina we had no idea that we wanted to use ceramic. Uh, actually, the Santa Catarina project maybe is more known about uh, his roof, 
but we started uh, as a neighbor project. You know, we live here. Uh, this is a photos of the 30s. Our house is more or less here. And during the 30s, this old part of city of Barcelona uh, went through a very, very big, uh, drastic urbanistic change. You know, they decided to do a kind of a cut going from the new part of the city to the sea, towards the sea. And during this cut, there was kind of a strange things happening, you know, a sort of violence which was uh, making the old city better and destroyed in the same time. You see here, here is... Uh, the Santa Caterina market. It was totally <laughs> embedded in, a, in, a, in an old city. And then we, we received, uh, many years ago now, something like uh, 17 years ago, we received from the city hall the, ch the, the uh, task to think about this place because it, they didn't come and say, oh, you have to do this work. They just said, oh, we have this problem. And we started to work with no real uh, um, contract, let's say. But we started to work as neighbors because, as, as I told you, our house is here. And this was our market. This was our fantastic market. And we wanted to know why it was so uh, derelict. It was so destroyed. It, and we wanted it to be a fantastic place. And we wanted the old city to be a fantastic place. But this was the situation, you see. In a beautiful city like, in a city like Barcelona, it was all gray, all decay. And it was maybe because it was many, many years of not really thinking or planning about this piece of city. This piece of city was supposed to be destroyed, to have another cut going through. And this blocked everything, you know? Nobody was really doing anything, and the city was, uh, was falling apart. So th what we have been doing on Santa Caterina, maybe also through this wonderful Comelia Roof, was trying to uh, give some life back to, the, to the, this piece of city of Barcelona and to make air go through. And, uh, and uh, you know, this uh, piece of city which was always very close to open up, not with a straight line, a straight cut as it was supposed to be, but with, with a softer way, you know? We, we did a lot of many models with, uh, with uh, this opening, trying to make the opening very, very much uh, touching the old city, and we tried to be very, very uh, subtle. You know, th this, is, uh, this is the market here, and this is a Rick's drawing, trying to understand how the existing and the new could go together, and how a new space, which is not a real cat, but it's just a sequence of, of plazas and, and, uh, and streets, could go together. So now we have another video, so it's, uh, it's good for me to exercise. Let's see if I can manage. No, I cannot manage. Maybe if I cannot manage it in, in three, it means that we don't have to see it. No, we have to see it. But it doesn't have the, the voice. What I like most about the study of Benedetta is the form in which they work. It's a study full of life, very luminous. Oh, it's a pity. The voice is the voice of a friend of mine. He's a film director, and he's the one who helped me filming these uh, small descriptions of projects. And he was very, very impressed by uh, the way people was working with hands in uh, in our studio. So he liked to film uh, the models and uh, and the studio in this kind of out of focus way and, and, uh, and uh, insisting very much on the hands. In fact, there was a need of many, many hands uh, to do this sort of documents. You know, these uh, this, uh, uh, models were very useful to us when we started to work on Santa Caterina because this piece of city was very complex and in that moment, many destruction were occurring and nobody was really knowing what was the real shape, the real situation of this old city. So we, we started to, to create those models with a really crazy ha uh, handwork to really recreate uh, the future possibilities for, uh, for these openings and for this new market, which we wanted to go out from this kind of enclosure and become part uh, of the flux of the, of the new city, of the people arriving, and, and really becoming a kind of an open place, uh, attracting people and uh, making people arrive here, then changing 
the, the destiny of this piece of city. So we always say this is a kind of urban project. And it was also a kind of a very magical project to us. Uh, here there was, a, uh, there was a church, there was a monastery, a monastery which was destroyed at the beginning of the last century because the city of Barcelona didn't have space. It was, as you see, as you saw, it was a very, very dense old city. And the only places with a little space were this monastery with little uh, clusters, uh, little gardens. And then the, the city and the state uh, took away these uh, uh, church properties and decided to make uh, a property for everybody. So when we started working on it, we were conscious about uh, uh, the past uh, underneath uh, this uh, market. And the past uh, revealed itself uh, very clearly at a certain moment when we started to dig and we found everything, you know? All the lines, all the traces of the past were there. And it was uh, really incredible because the past was going together with the future, was going together with the construction, and also was kind of uh, impressive thinking that it was the first time for these uh, stones to look back outside in the city of Barcelona and to see this new landscape uh, around them as a kind of, uh, of a miracle. No? I like the, these photos because these photos are kind of as if uh, the earth itself was watching around and discovering the city of Barcelona. And of course, uh, the monastery was a church, and in the church were the graveyards. It was full of, uh, of, um, of dead bodies and of people. So it was, it was strange, no? Every time we were going on site, we were kind of saying, oh, hello. And you have, yeah, you know, you have respect. You know, this was people, and, and you're doing great change on, 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 their, on their place, no? Centuries are staying here. And now you're making a change, and the chain is going, is similar, no? Also, this, uh, these bones are very similar to the bones we have found before. And, and uh, it's, a, it's really a kind of a very, very strong presence of history, and also a very, very strong lesson to us about the, the continuity of, of history in our work, in our uh, transformation of places which is a, a transformation where we have to be always very humble because, because uh, time is very strong and we are acting in a very, very little fragment of time. And we do try to do our best, you know, let's say. And we try to, to, uh, to make the place at least better as we have found it. And, and we tried to make the new roof, the new cover of Santa Caterina as a kind of a place full of air with uh, little pillars, uh, um, uh, kind of an airy uh, place uh, full of joy where many artisans were working. No? Like uh, Tony Cumelia, who was doing the ceramic, also the people who were doing the iron uh, parts, they were fantastic artisans working with their hands in a very, very difficult geometry but always able to find uh, solutions, to find way out, because as you see, they were really working uh, directly with the material, uh, not, uh, not in a distance, directly, so that they could always solve very, very difficult geometrical pro uh, problems. The geometry of Santa Caterina was incredibly difficult. Let's say uh, the engineer, and uh, this is a secret, the engineer who was making the calculation was always coming with a finished calculation after we had built a piece. So uh, we, we were always hoping and say, oh, let's hope that he comes with everything. No, now it's finished. But it's really complex. It's really difficult. <laughs> and, and at the end, it was really, we were based on the capacity of artisans to believe that the things that they were doing were, were possible, no? were uh, geometrically very difficult, but possible. And, and our, our aim was, uh, in a way, to bring to the city the happiness of, uh, of the inside of a market. I, I'm Italian. I'm not from Barcelona. When I went to Barcelona, I was really impressed by the, the wonderful places that market are. 
you know, you go to the market and they talk to you and they uh, call you, oh, what do you want, queen or princess? And you feel very happy and they explain uh, recipes and they make you buy three times more than you need. But really, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful situation. And this is also due to the uh, beauty of fresh fruit and fresh uh, vegetables and fishes and, and all these colors which are usually enhanced by the light which uh, come from, uh, from the roof of this traditional market is, uh, is uh, really fantastic and so we wanted it to be part of the outside, also part of the city, part of this renovation of bringing back light and colors into, into the city. And then I, I, in this moment, I went back to Tony Cumeglia and I told him, how many colors can you, can you give me? He said, oh, maybe 18. I said, no, this is too little. Why don't you try to give me a little more? And he really was incredible because he also told me, you know, we cannot make red in ceramic. But in fact, he went and uh, went to Germany, found new products. And at the end, he was able to produce more than 68 colors for the roof of Santa Caterina, and also to produce a lot of reds and oranges and all these colors, which in principle, it was impossible to have. And this, we, we, we worked uh, at the end with this kind of big pixels in order to have uh, the real shape of uh, fruit and vegetables. And then, uh, uh, Tony uh, was, uh, was working with, uh, with the colors and making this kind of things which everybody was thinking that they were eatable, you know, you always try to, to have a little piece of it. And this is the tries of the colors. And then from the colors produce the first styles. And then when the color were approved and we were really happy about, uh, about uh, the, the color we wanted, then the big pieces, the big hexagonal pieces, were produced and brought on, on, on site and then mounted directly from the site, uh, from, from, the, from the artisan place into, into the site. So this is uh, really the inside of the, of the um, Tony Cumeglia place. I don't know if he showed it. And this is from Tony Cumeglia arriving on site and having, they have a little map, you see, the same map that I show you. They have it on top of the roof, they prepare the roof, and they put these big hexagonal pieces. Actually, this hexagonal pieces was an intuition, and then I, I became friend with the director of the Science Museum in Barcelona, and he told me, ah, oh, you know, also in nature, hexagonal pieces are the most rational way to clad uh, complex geometries. For example, the eyes of a flea is, uh, is covered in hexagonal pieces. And I was very, very happy and very astonished. And in fact, these hexagonal pieces was working very, very well in the very difficult geometries that uh, we were finding in the roof of Santa Caterina and was adapting and then arriving on this, uh, on this uh, straight line, we had the necessity to do this kind of uh, craquelé, this uh, system, or here, for example, where we have uh, the, the sum of the hexagonal not meeting each other, then we make very little tricks that uh, Tony Comelia could do, could do very well. But then in principle, you, you just uh, uh, forget about the mistakes, but the, the, the roof is, uh, is working. And it became something very special, no? It became something very colorful. And I have to say I was kind of uh, afraid, no? When this colorful roof started to be visible in the city of Barcelona, and I was feeling kind of, oh my God, maybe we exaggerated a little bit, no? <laughs> This is something you have to go through. It's very difficult to be an architect <laughs> because you, you're dealing from something very intimate, which is something happening in your, in your office, then to everybody. You go to everybody. And the first time I was happy with this roof was because we live very nearby. I was uh, bringing my daughter to school and she said, oh, you have done a very colorful roof in Santa Catarina. I said, yes. Ah, oh, but it's very beautiful, my daughter. She was eight. And then I, I gave a big hug to my daughter, and I was so happy. 
And, uh, and in a way, it was uh, the opinion of the city of Barcelona, because many people stopped me then afterwards in the airport or somewhere, and they say, ah, oh, you've done this colorful roof, we like it. So it, it was a kind of uh, uh, something I started to feel a little more uh, comfortable about, you know, this uh, colorful roof becoming part of the landscape of Barcelona and becoming part of this urban change in the old city and making the air and people and everything flow and, uh, and uh, air go through so that life can start again in this piece of city which was uh, really strangled with no life for um, more than two centuries. So it's very complex. I, the, the project is a very complex project with uh, many different parts, but mainly it is a kind of uh, uh, cover, which is covering a piazza, and it's introducing to the old city, which is now open and open to, to, to everybody. So uh, now I, I this, is, uh, this is because I love to show my children, you know. <laughs> She's called Caterina. They have a, a story very much in, in synchrony with this project. This project was very magical, as I told you. Uh, Caterina was born, and we gave her the name of Caterina. And a few months after, we had to work on, on the Santa Caterina project. So I always told her that she was responsible for us to have this wonderful project. And Domenic, uh, his name is, uh, is coming from the name of the monks who were inhabiting the, the monastery. You know, we were working, working with Eric, and we saw a, a street name, which was Santa Caterina and San Domenic, coming from this, uh, uh, this origin. And we decided, oh, if we have a boy, we will name it uh, Domenic. And he came immediately. So, we <laughs> <laughs> so they are really part of the story. They are maybe seem not very happy, but they are very, very, very important part of the story. <laughs> If, if they knew about that, that I talked to you about them, they would be very angry now. <laughs> but now I like very much to go back, and this is a kind of a series of spy photographs of the surrounding of, uh, of Santa Caterina. And it's nice, no? When it's raining and you try to disappear because, of course, uh, some uh, guttering is, uh, is not working very well, but mm, people buying, uh, the old people always surrounding, a lot of immigration around Santa Caterina. And I like very much to see how life is flowing and changing uh, around Santa Caterina. And, of course, my favorite photos are those, no? With, uh, the two kids uh, becoming friends because they have uh, a skateboard and a place uh, to play together. No? So I hope Santa Caterina is a project like this, making uh, the surrounding better and making this very, very conflictive social situation of, a, of a, a quarter, which was very, very difficult, a kind of little better. So of course, we love it. But we go, we go on. I don't know how much time I have. And um, let's try to, to, to make the video go. How does it go? Wait a second. No, this is, cannot go. Nah. The imagination and the combination of water, uh, sculpture, and landscaping came together to really contribute one of the great parks in the world. Esos son realmente como unos croquis tridimensionales. Es casi como dibujar con un lápiz, pero hacerlo con un alambre. Es como si fuera una emanación del mar que llega eh, desde la playa y entra en la ciudad. Okay, cat. But the, the important part was, uh, was uh, the description, the voice of the man before he was our client. He, he was our client in this project. This was before being the project. And it's the Diagonal Mar Park. Uh, Barcelona had a very big piece of, of land, which was uh, um, an old industry, an old industrial park. And, and at a certain point, they wanted to transform it and to make it uh, 
uh, in a kind of new part of the city of Barcelona. So they called uh, a promoter from, uh, from United States. It was the first time that Jerry Hines was coming and work in Europe. And, uh, and he started this collaboration with the city of Barcelona and also with some of the architects in Barcelona. And some of them, it was uh, our studio. And we had to design the park which would connect for the first time the line of the uh, Avenida Diagonal with the sea and with a new uh, um, beach which uh, would, would exist here. So we, we, are, we were working in this way, you know, we were uh, uh, doing drawings of everything which was uh, happening in the history in this part of, uh, of Barcelona and also overlapping our desire, no? our drawing, which was uh, try to connect uh, this uh, new part of the Avenida Diagonal with the sea and try to have this ramblas like uh, bringing the water back into the city and bringing nature back into the city and make, uh, and make water and nature be nearly touching uh, the Diagonal. So this was our effort and to do that we, we wanted to have a kind of a artificial park, uh, working with, uh, like in a, in a Spanish patio, you know, you have a lot of ceramic, you have a lot of hard surfaces, and here, before entering the park, the, the nature was on top, was on top of your head, and it was in some pots that we were imagining in a kind of a confused way. A lot of colors, because of course we wanted uh, this uh, project to be full of things happening, full of, of mm, uh, wonderful places to, to, uh, to entertain yourself, no? as, as in the parks. And, and we were starting to think about this pot, no? the big pot that would flow on top of your head. How could it be? I have to say, and Beatrice, uh, who is here now, uh, was, uh, and was there at the moment, was uh, telling me, will you tell to the public that you were, uh, you were pregnant at the time where this design was done? <laughs> In fact, it is very similar to my uh, pregnant uh, profile, I have to say. But it, it made a very good base. And, and then we had to imagine how to clad it. You know? This was uh, one of the first time we were collaborating with, uh, with Tony Comelia, and Tony was saying, oh, we can do many different colors, we can make many different shapes. So we were trying to clad this uh, strange shape in, in many different uh, unusual ways. So we invented a, a tile which, uh, which had a geometry which was making uh, s um, shapes and also uh, shadows and maybe it was not cladding completely, closing completely all the empty spaces. And then also Tony Cumella was telling us that he could uh, photograph and uh, cast photograph on top of the, of, the, of the ceramic and so we started to investigate on uh, some flower materials which was in fact uh, things coming out from the garbage. So we were taking these uh, bottles or, uh, or other uh, things and make them become something very colorful, something very special, something very much changing. And we made a lot of these uh, this tries. And as you see then, the last part is done with the photographs of, of pieces of Coca-Cola uh, cans. And, and the Coca-Cola cans from a distance become something like uh, a bunch of roses or a bunch of flowers. So we did a lot of tries and at the end we arrived uh, on, on site. And of course you can see that the importance of Tony Comelia is everywhere. Also we dedicate to the pavimentation of the, of the, of the piazzas before entering into the park. From the, from the streets, you go into the park through piazzas. And we decided that these floors would be exactly the reproduction of some floors that we have in the studio. So nobody really knows, but uh, most of it is really coming directly from the studio to the pattern of the city. 
and 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 it's uh, it's beautiful no because we we live in a, in a house that we have found and when you have something very beautiful which you found you you think oh this is fantastic and maybe we can put this found uh, piece somewhere else so we we don't need to think very much we just have to to tell Tony Comelia please reproduce it and he reproduced it a little a little bigger in Greece and so he had his work here on the on the pot on these uh, pregnant pots and uh, also on the pavimentation of this uh, strange park in Diagonal Mar actually this park is working well um, Jerry Hines was very happy and also uh, at the end when when the things are happen are finished I'm happy to see how other people interpret the places no and uh, for example those photographs were a surprise to me which were done by by a blind lady blind lady who sees very 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 little but she uh, got all this uh, vibration into the diagonal mar park and brought me back this uh, fantastic photographs and i understood much more about this park about uh, the reason why it's so full of water and many things happening because it's trying to to bring into the city a strange vibration which usually is not is not there so let's see another video finished no more music it was uh, it, it was also a very special project this project <coughs> these are some sketches by Eric very very colorful these are sketches in the 90s uh, really 1990 and it was the first time um, we had drawings in the studio with with colors no it was uh, so colorful and then this was brought to the politicians this was a new park in the middle of a very complicated uh, neighborhood and, and everybody was saying, oh yes, this will be the color park. And of course, it's, uh, it's very logic. And the color park also is done with uh, a very, you know, very simple construction, also with very little money. It was done in many phases. And, and it's uh, now standing in, uh, in a peripheral part of Barcelona, in uh, Mollet del Valles. And here also we had, uh, uh, the, I think uh, sometimes it makes me think about uh, Alice in, in Wonderland. No? It's, a, it's a kind of uh, um, imagination part where, uh, where uh, imagination becomes uh, the physical thing of the park and makes people uh, stay or sit uh, or play and and water is there but is always there in a kind of a vaporized way so here Tony did a very very little intervention but also very beautiful no with this blue uh, blue fountains which are fountains where, where the water disappears immediately it only makes uh, the ceramic uh, a little more glittering because it's uh, it's wet and we reproduce there as a sort of uh, of remind to Eric who died the year before this little joke that Eric did Mollette del Valles is the name of a fish so he liked uh, to make this uh, signature for Mollette and we reproduce it with Tony on uh, on one of these fountains and what I loved very much is that this water is making a rainbow and I think a rainbow everywhere is a kind of a good luck uh, omen so the rainbow is now to me the symbol of the park uh, in in Mollet de Valles which is uh, a very special park this is seen by some neighbors uh, the neighbors did a kind of a photographic uh, uh, competition and some of these photos come from this uh, 
look of the same neighborhood uh, to, to their park. I think I have too many photographs today, so we, this we can go fast. Uh, in order to show you that then we were very happy about uh, using ceramic, you realize that ceramic is, uh, is uh, so important in so many places uh, in the world, not only in Europe. Even working in Hamburg in the, in the harbor, we realized that the harbor was uh, a very strong uh, ceramic place. You, know, you have wonderful traditional buildings in, in the Hafen in, in Hamburg. And we had here to transform, and we are still working on this, to transform the, the old harbor into a place for, for people. And so we were trying to give back to people a place a little like this one, no? where water and places where you can stand or where people can stay is t really mixing, is really mingling. And, uh, and that's why you have no real limits also now in this uh, new reform. And you have very different levels. And also you have many different materials so that people have the feeling that they are really back in a place where many things are happening. And, uh, and they use uh, this place in a way as if uh, they were from the Mediterranean. No, Hamburg is not very Mediterranean, I have to say. But we could, uh, we could transform it a little bit more. No? They, they were adopting and saying, oh, you're giving us something very Barcelona. But in, in fact, it's becoming a kind of a place for playing and for children and for families. And this, uh, this is something which, uh, which makes me happy. No? And uh, this is the traditional harbor with all this uh, fantastic uh, ceramic constructions. Also, we did, a, a, um, just uh, finished very recently, we, uh, we um, uh, enlarged this music school. This music school we built uh, 12 years ago or something like that. And then very recently, just here from where we are making the photos, they needed to make an, a big um, auditorium and so they said, we hope not to destroy the space. Please do another piece of this project as, uh, to enlarge uh, this music school. So the music school <laughs> is this one. This was finished in year 2000. And then we had to build all this new building, making a kind of a little brother, a brother and sister, united by, by this uh, stair and this ramp uh, so that uh, the building is becoming something different, the space is changing. And of course, uh, in the old building there was a lot of ceramic also, as uh, coming from the traditional ceramic in, in Germany. And in the new building also we introduced uh, uh, more than one material, but mainly this ceramic uh, echoing the sound uh, which can be produced uh, by, by music. No? Really, this was uh, a drawing that we were making about, uh, about the sound uh, becoming visible. And this was dedicated to a rake, and so it's called Miralles Saal. So I think we can go fast. Uh, uh, the building is now much better with the new extension. <laughs> and, and now we have in, uh, in uh, China something uh, very new to us. You know, we were, uh, we were not working, we have never work, we've been working in China until we received we won this competition for doing the Spanish pavilion, and we proposed to do the skin of the Spanish pavilion with wicker, with a, a handcraft, which was uh, surprisingly the same in Spain and in China. So we were proposing this experiment, which was very new to us, to make a kind of a building which was uh, proposing uh, a, a handcraft which was uh, usually for much smaller scale. And, and we did this exercise, and we of course were very scared no, to, to do something which we have never tried before. But at the end, this was uh, working. We were uh, trying to make uh, a dress, and we were using our office uh, and uh, the skills of the, of the people who work with hands in order to understand how to dress uh, the structure of the Spanish pavilion with, uh, with this material, which was a wicker. And, and we made a long investigation. It's not only 
the result of these photographs, but really we went uh, a lot in Spain to look around and uh, to understand how the artisans are still working with, uh, with this very, very old uh, type of craft. And we produced in Spain uh, these uh, prototypes so that we could bring them in, uh, in, uh, in China and they could produce it in, in China. Uh, here we were also trying to make uh, the pavilion become a big calligraphy because you can use different colors, even if they are natural, you can make uh, kind of uh, three or four different colors. So we were writing uh, beautiful phrases on top of the pavilion and we knew that this pavilion would be full of people and would have a lot of movements around this courtyard, which uh, was the patio and, uh, and uh, the exhibition which was talking about Spain. So the, the Spanish pavilion, we did also all the inside trying not to cut the spaces because the spaces are very continuous and of course to make the functions you have to divide from one function to the other. Uh, this is the entry for, uh, for the exhibition, the exhibition go around, but then who enters here shouldn't go on the other side. So there are furniture uh, kind of cutting the possibility of walking. Uh, here is a restaurant, uh, so you have the possibility to enter from this same open space. So it's a, it's a continuous place, um, continuous space, but uh, fluent, but with uh, interruption, which, uh, which are this furniture that we have been creating. And I always show the same photographs. I, I think in a way, I, I, I don't know, I should change them to some time, but I'm getting so in love also with this uh, history of the site. Uh, I, I like very much to look back at the moments where, uh, where the Spanish pavilion was under construction and to see uh, the people working, the hand uh, being always present and also the, the uh, natural material being always present in, uh, in an Asian construction is really extraordinary, you know? There is a lot of natural material being present on site and, and a lot of everyday nice uh, things happening in, uh, uh, on site, no people sleeping and resting, and and here is the people who is uh, uh, reproducing, copying the prototypes that we sent from Spain, and it is incredible how the language of la hands is the same. No, they they can uh, repeat uh, exactly what what they they received from Spain. There is no need uh, of any translation. And, uh, and the, the hands of many handicraft people reproduced more than 8,000 panels to go on the facade. This is the, the secondary structure going on on the facade. And uh, you see that also there were more uh, handicraft things on, on the side. And here everybody is preparing for receiving the panels, the wicker panels, which were arriving from the hands of the of the handicraft people on site and uh, mysterious because they are behind there. We didn't know how they were looking until they finally took away the scaffolding and we started to look at this uh, Spanish pavilion um, appearing and, and becoming something like uh, an individual in front of us. So this was a kind of a surprising thing. I remember this photograph I don't know, someone put it on our website and I remember a friend of mine who is not, uh, who is not an architect who found it and, uh, and then wrote me, oh, you really do very strange things. <laughs> Probably it's true, no? It's a, it's a strange thing. It's a, it's a strange animal. It's like a, a very gigantic pet which then became... <laughs> <laughs> became the pet of many, many, many people, no? Uh, many people, especially in China, they have seen this, uh, this Spanish pavilion and they enjoyed it probably because it was really very natural. Uh, expos usually are very unnatural places. They usually have mm, very little trees or very little nature and this very big uh, uh, facade or surface made in wicker 
was uh, was uh, smelling, was uh, reacting with uh, with the humidity, with the rain, with the sun. So it was really a feeling of being inside a, a wood, a feeling of being inside of a natural place, or, or to live a natural place in a, in a very artificial one. So I'm, now it's uh, it's still there. It was. Uh, decided that the, this pavilion will stay on the site of the expo. And so we are trying our best to make it work and to make it become part of the, of the city of Shanghai. You know? uh, still, we don't know what city of Shanghai will be here, but uh, let's see if uh, it can work together with the new city which will uh, grow around it. So very different situations. But I think now I don't have very much time, no? And I have too many slides. But just uh, to explain a little bit, this was uh, 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 something that arrived after the, the, the Spanish Pavilion project. Uh, they told us that maybe we could design a small museum for this uh, painter who was called Tsanda Chen. He was born in uh, Shizuan. In, uh, in a town called Neijan. And so the people of Neijan wanted to make an homage to Tsanda Chen. You see here, you know, like his look, he is a very special, fantastic painter. And also to the fact that he met Pablo Picasso in, uh, in the 60s in the, in the Côte d'Azur. Uh, they met and also Pablo Picasso uh, made a portrait of Tsanda Chen, which is the one on the left. <laughs> with the same brushes that Zanda Chen brought to him. Of course, Zanda Chen told him, oh, you have no idea how to use brushes, but Picasso <laughs> didn't care, and, uh, and, and that's it. This is the relationship. <laughs> so with this, with this portrait, we thought it was a very, very nice thing, no? the relationship between the two. And also they called us because they say, oh, you're also Spanish, like Picasso. Then it's, uh, we repeat here the relationship. So we use this as a kind of a, footprint to make uh, the plan of a small museum which uh, we didn't want to be uh, transformed into something else. We wanted it to be very also integrated with the little uh, uh, wood where it has to, 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 to be. And so we made uh, a, a building which is done with five different pavilions going around an existing tea house and becoming a kind of a new landscape, a new wood, confusing with the wood, and also letting the people who is visiting inside to look at the wood in the center or outside, and not only to look inside at the exhibition. Especially because when I was insisting and say, what kind of collection do you have? I discover they were always saying, oh, you don't worry, don't worry. And then I discover that I, I had, didn't have to worry because there is no collection at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, OK, I don't worry. I think we can do a good exhibition on Zanda Chen, even with a, a fantastic way of reproducing his life or his spirit or uh, his gardens. No? He was a very good gardener. He was creating fantastic gardens around his houses in Taiwan or in Brazil or in California because he escaped China in 49 and never came back. And so this is a way to bring him back. It's a fantastic occasion. And also it's a fantastic occasion to show the complexity of this painter who was not only a painter but was uh, a very complex and complete person. And this is a moment of the, of the opening uh, of the first stone. And we were very impressed, no? The colors, the happiness, the capacity of celebration of China. This is something that we maybe don't have, no? Even if it's, uh, if it's not a big place, this celebration was really joyful and, and, uh, and really special, no? And also very official in the same time. So now we are waiting for things to start, but meanwhile we had a beautiful visit of the governor of the region, who is here, and uh, it was in Madrid, and in Madrid lives the last daughter, the youngest daughter of Zanda Chen. I didn't know it was a discovery I did uh, during the time, 
And so we could invite her and her husband to, to this dinner, and they met again for the first time with the governor of the town where her father was born uh, and where they were exiled uh, for so many years. So things are coming back and this moment was uh, very important to me and, and I hope uh, this uh, will bring back a kind of uh, new knowledge of, uh, of uh, people who, who meet each other again. And, and here is, uh, is Danny, my collaborator, and he is uh, really afraid because, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the habit of the politicians is usually to drink a lot. And so he was uh, his uh, drinking uh, companion. They were making kind of fights. And he made uh, a dinner the night before, so he was totally destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and on that night, he was absolutely afraid. So there are too many things. Uh, here is a park we did. Uh, here is a, a high rise uh, we are trying to do in Shenzhen. It's beautiful, eh? but it's very complicated because, because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a promoter and the promoters, uh, they are growing very much, but to do a 50 story building is, uh, is complicated. And this year was also a kind of a recession year for, for uh, promoters in China. So I don't know, I might uh, propose this solution to some other promoters uh, in, the, in the world because it was nice, no? It was a, a very nice uh, building. And this is also a, a Fudan uh, campus, a campus we are designing now. We, are, we won this competition and uh, we are now designing a university campus in three blocks, trying to make these three blocks working together with ceramic and um, trying to make it uh, integrated with the city, but in the same time uh, looking uh, as if it is a unity. So it's, a, it's something very special. We are working right now, and, uh, but we don't have time to look at so many things. And also, this is a competition we did in Italy. This is like going in the office. No? In the office, you see so many things because we are always working uh, competitions and projects. and. And this is a competition in, in the north of Italy for a train station, which uh, we didn't win. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a, a very fast track uh, train station. So we did uh, this uh, park and this integration with, uh, with the surrounding. And then the train station in this, in this uh, special crossing. No? So the, the roof was using uh, the train on top to, 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 you see, to have uh, the covering with the minimum effort. You know? So it was uh, the structure of the train on top, the structure of the train underneath, and then this kind of uh, uh, minimum effort uh, pergolas using the same structure of the, of the bridge. This is one of the many competitions we didn't win. But then sometimes we have competition that we win, and uh, this is uh, one that we won. <laughs> it's in Ferrara. It, we are starting like this many times. I think this, uh, these are beautiful materials. No? And before knowing what you want to do, it's nice to be embedded in, uh, in many fantastic materials, a little like uh, uh, Chris is doing, no? with Chris and Chris are doing with their students. You are there and you look at the place, and you discover things, and, and you start to think about uh, possibilities for, uh, for this project that you're going to start. And, and this uh, church uh, was in, in a city, has to be in a city, which was uh, full of uh, episodes of, of earthquake in this uh, recent past. It was in March, uh, April, May. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, moment. So we started to think about making structures, kind of light structure for, for this church in, uh, in Ferrara. But then we, we gave uh, to the competition something which is less abstract than that, but which was also very abstract. And at the end, uh, we realized, uh, where, where did we put the cross? Oh, my God, we, we didn't put the cross. So I was desperate. I said, OK, uh, this is lost. We, we cannot win a competition of a church with no cross. But uh, 
we won it. So that's it. You, know, you, you have these surprises when you have this, uh, this profession. And this is just to, to finish, just a little to, to inform you and to, to, to give uh, a, a kind of an homage to Eric. Finally, I could open this uh, fund foundation, Eric Miralles. It's underneath our office. And it's an exhibition space where we will, uh, in the future, make exhibitions and also seminars and uh, lectures and ateliers. And uh, the results of these uh, seminars and ateliers will be exhibited in this space together with something similar that Eric has been doing in the past so that we can always investigate and always uh, have uh, the, the, the past becoming alive no? and uh, mingling with new, new thinking. This is, for example, the result of, uh, of uh, our Harvard studio uh, this year talking about Barcelona, about a difficult space in Barcelona, and is together with the reproduction of the, an exhibition which Eric did uh, in Harvard in 93. So it's the first exhibition, and it's the beginning of this foundation. The patrons of the foundation, you see them here, is Rafael Moneo, Oriol Boigas, is Mohsen Mostafavi, who was uh, supporting me in, uh, in making this uh, first uh, exhibition dealing with Harvard, and Izarata Izozaki, who you don't see because he couldn't come from Japan. But uh, this was also nice, and I think it was nice to present uh, Mosen here because uh, the first lecture I gave after the Eric's death in year 2000 was here in the AA, invited by Mosen, who was uh, uh, directing uh, the AA at the time. So I think this is, uh, uh, this is a possibility to, to go on with new activities in the studio. And uh, I, I leave the lecture here and I say thank you to, to all of you. <laughs> Questions at all? Um, anyone with any questions? I'm going to run around with a microphone, okay? Thank you. Hello. Um, I want to just ask you uh, mm, looking at your works, it's quite obvious how content is something that deals with, in your work especially, with emotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because you, you, you find something really strong without uh, an aesthetic of control or, uh, or uh, uh, powerness, let's say. And uh, I would ask you, how do you, do you came to this kind of lightness? <laughs> and the second question is, do the fast, I'm shameless, uh, if you are uh, hiring or not at the moment in your studio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, we are, we are hiring, but we are very poor, you know? Okay. <laughs>